Y'all remember Spy Kids 4? Let me rephrase that. Y'all remember Spy Kids? They made four of the fucking things and apparently gonna make another one. The fourth one was called All the Time in the World. G get it? It, it, it's, it? It's a time pun? Because because the movie is about time. I don't have a segue for this. Sergei Tabaritsky. He's kind of about time, too. Kinda. The funny clock man makes his debut on the channel, after maybe a little bit too much time spent on the backlog. In this video, I will make my case for why Tabby should be the main antagonist of the next Spy Kids movie. Now, the clock is ticking, so let's get started. Sergei Vladimirovich Tabaritsky was born on August 12th of 1897 in St. Petersburg, Florida, I mean Russia. Right out of the gate, the man is a walking contradiction. He was a bastard child with a notably Jewish-born mother, and pulled his last name from her first husband, who was also Jewish. She would be baptized into the Orthodox faith in 1889, and as a result, Tabby and his brother would still be raised Christian. Of course, his questionable origins screwed him over a fair bit, so he would have to wait over the clock in his mother's life in order to even try to be accepted into the Orthodox Church fully. All of the documentation declared to be the children of Jews, and in early 1900s Russia, this would pretty much fuck you out of just about everything. As a result, Tabby was very devoutly religious and a staunch monarchist even from a young age, just so he could try and fit in if nothing else. When his mother's time finally did run out in 1914, he lodged an appeal with the church in St. Petersburg to sort of rebaptize him or something similar, I don't know, I don't speak crazy. He really didn't like the fact that he was Jewish by blood, referring to it as Cain's seal, which is just... yeah. The church, to their credit, promptly told him to fuck off. He graduated high school in 1915 and then falls off the face of the earth until 1919. He could have fought in World War I, or he didn't and was just some minor bureaucrat somewhere, or he just fucked off to the bush to live off the grid for all we know. Chances are he fabricated a shitload of his life to obtain citizenship in Germany later down the line, but we'll get to that in a minute. All that matters is that at some point after the Russian Civil War started, he ends up in a Ukrainian prison. While here, he would meet another monarchist called Peter Shabelsky Bork. <laughs> Bork. They apparently had a hell of a time and got along very well, and he's rather important down the line to so keep him in mind. After he spent his time in prison, he would fuck off to Germany, where things start to get a little wacky and uncharacteristic. He lived somewhat low during this time, publishing a gamer magazine called Ray of Light, which was comically racist and also happened to include a repub of a thing called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Basically, it's a fabricated document detailing the Jewish plan for world domination. It's complete horseshit, but that wouldn't stop Tabby, who played a very key role in popularizing the thing in Germany. Bork had come to Germany around this time as well, and the two started, apparently, doing drugs and coming up with a funny plan. So there was this political party in Russia before the commies took over that was called the Constitutional Democrats, or KDP, usually simplified to the cadets. They were pretty standard liberals, not like fake-ass Canadian Trudeau liberals, I mean actual liberals, who wanted real democracy and human rights and a strong economy and shit like that. The party was founded by one Pavel Milyukov, who was a pretty prominent Russian politician forced to flee after the Civil War kicked off. He spent his time in exile holding lectures and publishing little newspapers and encouraging the white movement to do its thing. Well, for one reason or another, probably because he was a liberal and thought monarchists was kind of cringe, Tabby and Bork fucking hated the guy, so much so that they plotted to assassinate him. On March 28th, 1922, the pair made their move. They took a quick jaunt to Berlin and went to wherever the fuck Pavel was at, I don't know, literally everywhere I look gives a different fucking answer, but a political conference that happened to be at the Hall of the Berlin Philharmonic makes the most sense, so we're going to go with that. Anyways, the two showed up with guns while Milyukov was speaking, rushed the stage, and started shooting. The first shots missed, and in response, a friend of Milyukov, Dmitry Nabokov, attempted to tackle Bork and get his gun away. Tabby would turn and shoot three times, instantly killing him. They would also manage to injure nine other, somewhat unrelated people in the process. Knowing that the clock was ticking and that they had fumbled the bag and lost their chance to put Milyukov in the dirt, the two tried to dip, but would be knocked and held down by an understandably kinda concerned and pissed off crowd. Now, as a bit of an aside, for certain fans of morally reprehensible degeneracy that may be in the audience, the name Nabokov may ring a bell. Because Dmitry Nabokov had a son named Vladimir Nabokov. Seeing one's father shot dead in front of them would naturally cause a bit of mental trauma. It is in this state that Vladimir would write a little book called Lolita. That's right. Sergei Gaming Tabaritsky was directly responsible for the creation of Lolicon. I will die on this hill, I'm an internet micro-celebrity, which means this is, in fact, canon. Anyways, the two were tried and sentenced to 14 years, of which Tabby served five. For murder. Primarily because a lot of people kept petitioning the government to let them go, and they finally went, fine, fucking leave, whatever. He first applied for German citizenship in 1932, claiming some Baltic German ancestry through his mother of all people, and that he was a hard-working dude just trying to pass the time and make his way in the world. In every version of his story, his Jewish ancestry was rigorously scrubbed in favor of a noble German mother and a father that didn't exist. He said he was in the Tsar's army and made lieutenant, collaborating with the Germans in the Baltics against the Bolsheviks, getting captured by the Ukrainians and released by the Germans with him tagging along. This application was rejected because not enough time had passed since he had come to the country. He petitioned again in 1933, 
1933, after the Nazis came to power, this time completely changing his story. This time, he was a pure-blooded Aryan who fought with a Siberian artillery regiment and deserted because they were not racially pure enough for him. He fought the Bolsheviks and was barely able to escape the noose multiple times before again being captured by the Ukrainians. Much of the whole I am comically anti-Semitic stuff comes from this version of events. No longer was he just a hard worker who got a little unlucky, but it was the leftists and the Jews and the Freemasons that were fucking him over. So yeah, literally every part of this guy's life could be totally made up. Taboritsky is, in fact, Alfarius. His applications kept getting rejected, and every time he kind of just made them more vitriolic towards the Jews, the communists, and just about anyone who he thought the Nazis didn't like. He said he'd join the SA at one point and would go as far as to personally write Joseph Goebbels and say, pretty pleased with cherries on top. I guess they got sick of his bullshit after a while, so they said fine. Tabby married Elizabeth von Nord to seal the deal, and in 1938 he got his citizenship and joined the Nazi party. Yay for him, I guess. Two years prior, he'd begun work as part of the Bureau for Russian Refugees in Germany. It was basically a hand of the Gestapo designed to keep tabs on Russians in Germany, and Tabby being Russian made him uniquely suited for this role. He would have plenty of correspondence with the Gestapo for similar reasons. Surprisingly enough, Tabby was actually the sane, quote-unquote, one for much of his life, especially compared to Bork, considering that he would spend some time in a psych ward, perfectly content to be a pencil pusher for this organization to kill some time. Now, granted, this organization pretty much only exists to keep the Russians in check and make sure there were any Jews among them, but compared to the whole Alexei thing, it's pretty tame. That's right, Sergei Taboritsky's TNO personality was entirely fabricated to tell a story. Anyways, in 1939, he would also help with the creation of the National Organization of Russian Youth, which was a wing of the Hitler Youth specifically for Russian emigres that was directly controlled by the SS. The irony of this fucking guy is palpable. I suppose the Nazis always were the party of contradictions, but letting a Jewish-born Slavic monarchist work that closely with the fucking SS takes the bloody cake. When Operation Barbarossa kicked off, Hitler started his race against time to kill the Russians before his supplies ran out. Tabby briefly helped recruit some Russian translators from the people the Bureau had on file, but other than that, he didn't do a whole lot. He moved to Berlin in 1944 and would stay there until the Soviets came knocking. They actively tried to hunt him down, being a Russian Nazi monarchist and all, but all they found were dust and echoes. Tabby had vacated the city a while earlier. Apparently, during all of this, he was actually pretty well liked by his neighbors, and is consistently described as a rather calm, serious, and attentive individual, after that whole drug field assassination attempt thing. Meaning he was, later in his life, overall a pretty swell guy if you ignore his politics. He would even, apparently, directly defy orders and help a bunch of Russian immigrants leave Berlin before it was surrounded after preventing their mobilization. This, in my opinion, kinda hammers home the point I tried to make with Yazov. Many of the wacky people represented in Hearts of Iron mods were, at the end of the day, just people, asterisk, unless you're fucking no longer, but that's neither here nor there. They may have had some interesting philosophies, questionable track records, and participation in other fun and exciting clusterfucks, but ultimately, they were still simply human, going about their day and doing their job and living their lives as any other. Tabby was still a monarchist and still had a hatred of communism to the point where he was willing to see his homeland destroyed by the Germans just to get back at them, but it's quite far from the absolute nutcase seen in TNO. Not excusing him of anything, of course, he was still a pretty shitty person and, you know, a fucking Nazi, but it's something to think about, I guess. Tabby would flee to Limburg, where he spent the rest of his life in relative seclusion. Being of relatively low standing certainly has its benefits. The only thing of note he did during this time was write a short obituary in a Brazilian monarchist newspaper when Bork died in 1952. His clock struck midnight on October 16th of 1980 at the age of 83. He didn't live long enough to see his most hated enemy fall, but at the end of the day, he kinda got what he wanted. Autocracy and all. And that was Sergei Taboritsky. He's a pretty funny TM guy, but not too funny. Not quite liberal use of chemical weapons funny, but he's still an interesting guy. Yeah. Guess I should say that this is the 1K special, that could be higher than that by the time this goes up, but eh, close enough. Just wanted to say thanks, and that y'all are awesome. I know in the grand scheme of things, 1K isn't a lot, but for a dumbass shitposter like me, it's still wild to think about. It's more people than I went to high school with, and that's, like, my entire metric for judging what a shitload of people is as it stands. Anyways, thanks again, and, uh, here's to 1,000 more. That about does it for this video, thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.